a thing we're doing right now called Against the Grain for Musicians. And it is um, where you can submit a one take iPhone video if you're a musician. Of, and I know a lot of filmmakers are musicians, so hopefully this applies to you. Um, a one take video uh, on your phone of you doing what you do. Um, and then we are putting it on this page called Against the Grain uh, under Cross Arts website. Um, and we have a virtual tip jar on there. And so all the money goes to the musicians, every single bit of it. And we put out checks every two weeks. And Cross Arts is also giving $50 to every musician who submits a video. So um, if that, if you fit that bill, please send us videos. I think we have about a hundred different artists on there right now. Um, and so that's working out great. So we're trying to just do something during this time to get stuff out there. Um, otherwise, just hope to hope this all ends magically at some point and we're all back in the theater and all back living life. So. That's really it. Thanks for having us. And I'm excited to hear everybody talk tonight as someone who has to edit every day. I'm wanting to hear what everyone has to say. So thanks. That's it. Cool. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Crosstown thanks. Arts for being our longtime partner in this program. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Joseph Carr. I'm the Director of Artist Development and Youth Film with Indie Memphis. Uh, thank you all for joining us at uh, Shoot and Splice tonight. Um, you know, somehow in all of the years we've been doing Shoot and Splice, uh, we've never actually had one specific to editing. I don't know how that's happened, but it has. Um, but I think it uh, will, you know, it was worth the wait considering the awesome guests that we have tonight in our uh, virtual Shoot and Splice. So um, yeah, normally we host these uh, live on the first Tuesday of every month at the Crosstown Theater. But for the time being, we're excited to be uh, hosting these discussions online and still working to bring the uh, filmmaking community together. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, so before we get started, um, I wanna thank our Shoot and Splice sponsors. They are Mark Jones, uh, Firefly Grip and Electric, LensRentals.com, Music and Arts Studio, and Via Productions. Uh, those sponsors are also the in-kind sponsors of our Indie Grants. Um, the Indie Grants is our filmmaker grant program in which we provide cash and in-kind services to three different Memphis-based filmmakers to produce short films. Uh, we have one for narrative short film, one for documentary, and new this year, which I'm really excited about, is our proof of concept grant, uh, which is for filmmakers with a narrative feature film in development to produce a proof of concept short film based on that feature. Uh, so please visit IndieMemphis.org to learn more about those grant opportunities. Um, we're also excited to continue with our Indie Memphis Movie Club. If you haven't heard, uh, Movie Club offers weekly virtual screening opportunities for brand new films and classics. Uh, plus, we have online Q&As on every Tuesday between our programming team and special guests. Uh, this past Tuesday was a really special one. We had um, our artistic director, Miriam Bale, had a discussion with Moonlight director Barry Jenkins uh, about the 1943 classic film, The More the Merrier. Uh, that conversation is um, up on our YouTube channel right now. Um, and so will all of our past and future movie club discussions will be there. Um, we uh, just added two new movie club films, uh, the French comedy drama On a Magical Night and the LGBTQ comedy Straight Up. Uh, these are free with your Indie Memphis uh, membership credits or you can rent the film for uh, $12. Um, the next Movie Club Q&A is going to be with feature, uh, featuring the author and journalist Catelyn Moran. Uh, she'll be in conversation with uh, Miriam Bale discussing our Movie Club featured film, How to Build a Girl, uh, which is based on Moran's best-selling semi-autobiographical novel. Uh, that's currently available to stream on VOD and the, all the major VOD platforms. Um, and that's going to be next Tuesday, May 12th, uh, with a little earlier start time at 4 p.m. Central. So mark your calendars accordingly. Okay, so um, how this evening is gonna work is uh, first uh, our panelists will begin the conversation and uh, once the Q&A portion begins, uh, you have two options for um, entering uh, questions. You can either use the raise hand option, which you can see on your screen, you can hit raise hand. Um, if you do that, I will call on you and I will make you a panelist temporarily, which will open up your microphone. And if you want to, you can open up your video and you can ask your question directly or you can submit your questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you don't want to um, be on camera or any of that. You can just enter your question on the Q&A button. Um, and we'll do that at the end after their, uh, the, the main 
uh, portion of the discussion. Um, okay, so at this time, uh, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our moderator first, uh, Laura Jean Hawking. Uh, Laura Jean is an award-winning Memphis filmmaker, best known for editing and producing the feature films Antenna, Auto Music Can Do No Wrong, Good Grief, and Bad Bad Men, as well as numerous short films and music videos. Uh, her most recent editing work is the upcoming feature documentary, Juvenile, as well as the short documentary film, The Little Tea Shop. Uh, she runs her production company, Oddly Buoyant Productions, with her husband, filmmaker, Chris McCoy. Laura Jean, welcome. Hey. <laughs> And uh, now our panelists. Uh, first up, we have Eileen Meyer. Uh, Eileen is a film editor and producer based in Los Angeles, California. Uh, in 2016, she was awarded the Karen Schmier Editing Fellowship and was nominated for the Cinema Eye Honors Outstanding Achievement and Editing Award for the documentary Best of Enemies. Uh, Eileen received her BA in film from Hampshire College in 2004, then began her career in New York City and Memphis, Tennessee. We're very happy to have Eileen uh, uh, back in and working with us in Memphis. Um, she also produced and edited numerous award-winning shorts, features, and TV series, including most recently, uh, The Devil Next Door and Crip Camp, both of which are available on Netflix right now. So welcome, Eileen. Thank you. It's great to be here. Excellent. Um, and next up, we have panelist Michael Taylor. Uh, Michael is a member of the American Cinema Editors and has a mile long of awesome editing credits to his name, um, including White Girl, Love is Strange, Entertainment, The Mountain, The Memphis Shot, uh, Free Indeed, among many, many others. Um, he was nominated for an Ace Eddie Award for Best Editing of a Feature Comedy for Lulu Wang's The Farewell, starring Aquafina, which went on to rack up many awards all over, including Best Feature at the Independent Spirit Awards last year. Uh, his most recent project is Edson Oda's Nine Days, uh, which won the Waldo Salt Award for Best Screenwriting at the 2020 Sundance Film Festival. And Sony Pictures Classic will be releasing that film later this year. So please be on the lookout for that. And welcome, Michael. All right. Oh, Michael, you're muted. You're muted, Michael. Uh, ah. Thank you. Glad to be there. Thanks wow. for the introduction. Of course. Thank you all for, for joining us tonight. I'm really, really happy and really excited to have all of you here. So, um, okay, at this point, uh, I will vanish from your screens and uh, Laura Jean is going to take over this conversation. And again, if anyone has any questions, please just wait till the end and we will open up that portion of the conversation. So thank you very much, everybody. Laura Jean, it's all yours. Thanks, Joseph. Um, I'm really excited to be moderating this conversation. Um, I'm a big fan of both of these editors and their work, but also I never get to talk to editors. So <laughs> I wanna pick your brains. Um, and also to everybody watching, if you haven't seen Crip Camp or The Farewell, you must go see, well, not right now. After this conversation, go see the movies, but now we're gonna talk about stuff. Um, so I wanted to start with just sort of like everybody's beginnings and how, since we have a, a largely filmmaker audience, um, sort of discuss how we got into editing. And I'll just start with a brief version of mine and then I'll let y'all roll with whatever you want to, to do. Um, I came at, at editing with a visual arts background. Um, I did a lot of collage art, so it just seemed like a natural progression. Um, and I did a lot of collages in my room when I was younger and I was all alone making my art and now I'm alone in my room making collages with their movies. Um, I got into film production in 2000 and I was a caterer and I did craft services and I made props and then I became a producer. And then um, my husband and I wrote a feature film and he produced or I produced and he directed and then I got the Apple Pro Training Series book for Final Cut 5, and I did all the lessons in the book, and then I edited a feature film. <laughs> it was the first thing I edited. I don't recommend this to anybody who's getting into it. There was no YouTube tutorials or anything. It was just that damn book. So anyway, Eileen, would you like to start? Sure. Um, so, I started out, I went to college and studied documentary film in college. 
but I didn't necessarily know that I wanted to be an editor yet. I just kind of knew I wanted to do film, um, but I didn't know what. And so um, after college, I got a job at like a small independent documentary production company in New York. Um, and I kind of did everything for them. I was assistant editor. I would go on all their shoots with them. I was a sound person. I was like office manager. I did everything. So I learned all the different stuff and it was like an amazing experience. I think just working at a really small company where you can really get your hands on lots of different um, aspects of the film making process. Uh, but then I kind of got burnt out on New York. Like I was just working all the time and I was broke and I hated New York. And um, and that's when I moved to Memphis. And I was just like um, working on some film projects with some friends mm -hmm. in New York and came down to Memphis. And we were working with like the Stax Museum and I just like totally fell in love with Memphis um, and ended up living there for six years. Um, and Memphis was really like, where I started editing. Um, Alan Spearman gave me my first real editing job. Um, he hired me as an assistant editor and then uh, liked what I did and was just like, you're the editor. And um, I think he was planning on editing more. And so he kind of stepped back a little bit and let me do more. Um, and then Robert Gordon gave me my next job and um, I worked with him for many years. And so uh, there were a lot of like mentor filmmakers in Memphis that like really gave me my start. Uh, me. Let's see, I started out being, uh, let's see, it's complicated. First, I worked at Channel 13 in New York for a few years, working on documentaries and television fundraising. You know, they have those fundraising shows where People will sing songs and, you know, you give money during the pledge breaks. I did one of those at Carnegie Hall. And um, then, uh, let's see, eventually I became a script supervisor. And I did that for about 15, 20 years, mostly through the 90s. And I don't think I was thinking about being an editor. I mean, at that point, I was, I was real happy script supervising. But I worked with all these great people. I worked with uh, Ang Lee on some of his early films, uh, Eat, Drink, Man, Woman, and The Wedding Banquet, uh, Todd Solon's Happiness and Storytelling, Kenny Lonergan, You Can Count on Me, uh, Mark Forster, Monsters Ball. So these were all kind of the films that I think I was interested in doing eventually as an editor, you know, I was learning about these filmmaking techniques by working with people like that. But the, the film that was really most transformative to me <clears throat> was uh, Julian Donkey Boy by Harmony Corinne. It was a dogma film and it was very small crews, just me, uh, Anthony Dodd Mantle, who was shooting it, brilliant guy. Um, and uh, there were like, there was a sound person and there was no, no grips, no electrics. And uh, there was this woman, Jill, who was like all overall, you know, camera assistant, first, um, first AC, that kind of thing. And Jill, uh, Harmony and Werner Herzog and Chloe Sevigny and all of us just driving around in this 15 pass. Oh, and Ewan Bremner from England making this movie for like two months. It was like, it was like paradise. But the thing is, this was in 1999, I realized as we were shooting it that I really wanted to be a part of putting it together. But they already had this great editor from um, Sweden who'd come over, uh, who'd cut uh, the ceremony. So I realized I needed to learn editing. I went to the Edit Center in New York. That's where I learned in 2001. And then I just, I just started doing uh, really low budget films initially just to you know, learn how to do it. And uh, that's, that's what I've been doing uh, pretty much since then. Um, initially I was doing a lot of documentaries uh, mixed with some narrative features. And now it's, now the equation's a little the opposite, mostly, mostly uh, working on films with actors, but the occasional doc too. So it's fun, I like it. That's why, I mean, that's, I love it. And I've, there's a lot of people out there who hate 
editing. A lot of filmmakers hate it so much. I hear them all the time. They're like, oh my God, please don't make me edit. I'm like, what? <laughs> it's like the best thing in the world to me. Um, so I want to, I have a bunch of questions and I'm just going to jump around to them. So basically the first thing I'm going to talk about is uh, director relationships because for us and y'all to be editors, there has to be a director somewhere, right? So, um, and when you, when an editor, when one is in the edit, you and the director are creating a movie for the audience at that point. And the editor is the audience surrogate, right? But then you still have to, you have to realize the director's vision within your vision for the piece. Um, how do you, and this is, and, and I'm thinking about this for an audience, uh, our audience here who is uh, newer filmmakers and low budget filmmakers. How do you balance that? How do you get that balance with, with what you have in mind and what the director has in mind? all the while making a movie that the audience will enjoy. Well, um, Eileen, you wanna go or? I guess I'm going. Um, <laughs> by the way, my friend, uh, Adam Honberg uh, asked me to remind you guys or let you know what a script supervisor does uh, in case you haven't worked with one. Uh, a script supervisor technically keeps track of all the continuity on a film because you shoot everything out of order. You know, what, what the actors are supposed to be wearing, what day it is, even what emotion they might have. Um, and that is a big part of the job, but the really interesting part of scripts arising for me was if you've got a, you know, a shooting day of 10 or 12 hours and you can do say 20, 25 shots, how are those shots ultimately going to be go together to make a scene or, and, and how, how is this scene going to flow to another scene? But, more importantly, almost like, how do you construct a scene out of footage? So, and very often you're in a situation where you have um, an ambitious shot list and you can't actually do all the shots you want to do. Uh, so what can you possibly give up uh, while working within the director's vision? And in fact, Largy, and what you mentioned sort of fits in with your question. Um, I don't have a vision for any of these films. Uh, I'm just the editor. My job is to get inside the head of the director and see what their vision is. I mean, trust me, I like The Farewell. Lula Wong had a very, very strong concept of that film. Now, when I signed on to do that film, I supported that vision and I tried to help her achieve that as much as possible. But, you know, if I, if I wanted to do that story in a certain way, then I should have been the director instead. My job is really to use the techniques of editing to enhance and to, it sort of gets us at your question of, of the audience. I always think of the audience behind me. So if, if I'm watching a scene with the director and the director loves it, that's great, of course, it's nice for, for me but it, it's only good if I also think it's gonna work for an audience because the director will have certain things in their head they know from having written it. And, uh, and that's where I will come in. And I wouldn't really call it a vision exactly, but I would say, um, well, let's just remember that the, those people in the audience, they don't have that information you have. And mm -hmm. for this film to be successful on a certain level, uh, you want them to, to be able to tap into this, whether or not, you know, it's not that we have to spoon feed them necessarily. We don't have to give them everything. In fact, I don't think we should. Uh, we should have them asking questions as they watch these scenes and hopefully uh, uh, answer these questions to a certain degree in subsequent scenes. And even at the end of the movie, they might still be asking questions. I, I love it when we, you know, when we have Q and A's at the end of movies at film festivals, where sometimes an audience member will say, you know, after he swam out to the sea, uh, what happened? Uh, did he commit suicide or not? And uh, 
a, you know, I think it's great if the director then says to the audience, well, what, you know, what do you think? How would you end the story? And sometimes that's frustrating for people because I think uh, we're so used to, in, in some of the media we have, especially in this country, um, being told exactly what it is. And so I've been fortunate and I've been able to work on the kind of films where, uh, although there is money at stake, it's not always a huge amount of money at stake. So we can experiment a little bit and sometimes it works out and, and sometimes it doesn't. But um, I hope that answers your question. I, I, I feel I maybe I was not, with the editorial vision, maybe it was not the right uh, thing to say, but uh, sometimes in the edit, there is this conflict with the director and the director's vision and what you as the editor or what one as the editor knows will communicate to the audience. Do you have, what's, what's your take on it, Eileen? Um, yeah, I think it's, there's a lot of different aspects to that. Like, it's a little different in documentary because often you're discovering the story together. And so uh, sometimes, you know, I think as you're discovering the story, everyone is sort of like responding to things and like making their like argument for or against something. And you're like, it's that like back and forth. And then sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. And, but it's like, <laughs> finding that balance. But I think what's really like at the heart of that is the, the re real relationship between the editor and the director. Like it's a marriage mm -hmm. and you have to be, you have to really trust each other. You have to come onto the project and like talk a lot and really understand what it is you're trying to make before you even start making it. Um, and I think sometimes you work with people where it just doesn't click and that's okay. But it's like, you have, it's like, it's like dating. Like you just, you have to find the right <laughs> people to, you know, you have to be on the same page. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I always like to have a conversation with directors, like, where is this movie coming from for you? You know, like, is this like a personal thing? Because I, I need to know if that's gonna be part of it for you, you know, like if this is like a personal story that, you know, something that happened to you as a child or whatever it is, I need to know that going into the edit and that, that way I can have emphasis or de-emphasize things. Um, so that kind of leads to another thing, like that's one of the things I love about editing and one of my favorite things about editing feature films, I do a lot of short projects too, and they're fun and you can just like get in and out really quick. But I love feature films because I love the assembly process because it's like opening up like an endless row of like Christmas presents. You're like, oh, what's in here? You know, what can, what can I do with this? And what's over here? Um, and it's just like this. And when, when the assembly is over, when I have like, when that, like just watching everything is over and I have the movie, I'm like, well, it's not any fun anymore. <laughs> like going to a premiere is fun, but it's not as fun as like actually working on it. Um, so what uh, for younger, well, not even for young, everybody. Um, there are times in edits when, and this sort of like comes from what we were just talking about. Um, when you find something new about a character or a subject that influences a story that was not originally emphasized or part, emphasized in the documentary or part of the script. I had a feature film I worked on a couple of years ago. There was a character who started out, it was a comedy and he started out as this kind of like this asshole character. And then he sort of like was growing as a human being during the movie. And then, and this was all in the script and I read it and it was fine. So, but watching the movie and then there was this part near the end where he did this really not very nice, he had this very not nice scene and reading it was completely different than watching the actor do it. 
And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't put the audience through this. They really invested in this guy throughout the movie. I can't let them down. And then you're supposed to sort of cheer for him at the end afterwards. And so that was like a, a really hard moment for me and a hard moment for me and the directors. I was like, we can't do this. We have to cut the, and we, so we actually cut out like a whole entire little part of a scene and it worked and, we, and nobody missed it. You know, so have y'all had these moments where you start, something is dis discovered or like in a documentary, sometimes one of the things I like about both documentary and narrative, but it's, uh, particularly documentary is how much you really have to listen to your subjects. You know, you may have been at the interview um, and you heard everything and you've seen the transcripts and everything, but sometimes you get a little something that really reveals a lot about them that was not originally emphasized. Does that make sense? Are y'all following me? Does anybody have anything? Or are you just gonna let me babble? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I'll jump in, I guess. Uh, I had a film a couple years ago uh, that was based on a play. And, the, uh, you know, so we, we were always struggling with like uh, this, you know, the screenwriter was a really nice guy, but all, with, without a huge amount of experience. And uh, he adapted the play. Probably in retrospect, it might have been nice to have someone else do the adaptation, although I do think he did a terrific job. The movie's called A Kid Like Jake, and uh, Silas Howard was the director. And it deals with a four-year-old kid who, uh, who may or may not have transgender or uh, transgender expansive uh, aspects to his personality, even though he's only four. And when this was first done as a play, maybe seven or eight years ago, the whole um, uh, cultural discussion of being uh, transgender uh, was still relatively new to mainstream society. And the, the parents in the play, which was done at Lincoln Center, were, you know, sort of Park Slope, liberal, New York types, but they really weren't thrilled with, with the idea of having a transgender kid. Just like you might've had a <clears throat> drama maybe a generation ago with uh, parents not being thrilled about having a gay kid. Uh, but we found when we were doing the film, which was just two years ago, that it, it wasn't playing very well to have people like Claire Danes and Jim Parsons be so sort of judgmental about their kid. It worked fine on the script page. And we found that we simply had to make the movie more about uh, how would society perceive their kid and what could they do to help him be whatever he or she is going to be and to create that kind of loving environment for him. Uh, and it, it actually became more about, in fact, should we accentuate this aspect of the kid because you're trying to get into like you know prestigious kindergartens so sort of what the movie was about changed in the editing a little bit in terms of emphasis uh that way the other th thing about it was when it was a play you actually never saw the kid so it, you know it made sense you know when you're doing a nightly play on broadway you you know you're not gonna have a four-year-old kid hanging around all night long. And for the movie, it was sort of the idea, same idea, like if we don't show the kid, then the audience can um, make, make up for themselves what he or she is really about. Well, we found that that concept, that didn't work at all. Uh, we filmed him a little bit and we had sounds of him, but when we started having test screenings, people were just, we want to see Jake. The movie is called A Kid Like Jake. And you're showing us these parents and these neighbors, but we don't, we can't see the kid for ourself. Um, I mean, Eileen, you can tell me what your perspective is on this, you know, on the docs you've done in terms of just having sort of uh, access to your characters or evidence, if, if you will, of, of who the people are. You know, it just wasn't working to have people talk about this kid. So we ended up having to do a couple of days of reshoots just around the kid so that we could situate him at different times, you know, you know within the film. That's my answer. Totally. I mean, I, I think um, I'm a big fan of organically meeting 
uh, your interview subjects like in archive, if you can do that. Uh, I think it like, as opposed to just having like talking heads that speak anywhere in a film, like if, um, if you can meet them in an organic way and then they become sort of the talking heads, like they become more of like an actual character, you know? Um, so, but going back to like the original question, I think, um, you know, I, I really love working on archival documentaries specifically. Um, this is something I've discovered over time working on a lot of different types of projects, but I keep coming back to archival and I just like, it's my favorite. And it's partly because you do have that process of just like at any point in the editing process, there, there's always like continually, like you're always looking for more archive because it could be anywhere. And so you're always searching and you're always looking for more until you're totally done with the film. And a lot of times like you'll find something at the very end of editing that changes everything. And that it's like the piece you were missing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I don't know how we would have made this film if we like never found this one thing. Um, and an example of that in Crip Camp uh, was the footage of Judy Human um, after uh, the, the whole like sit in and the 504 victory and everything. Um, the she's like talking to this group of women and she's saying like I'm I, everything should be great now but I'm tired of being thankful for accessible toilets and if I have to feel thankful for that like when am I ever going to be equal in society and so that like shifts like you've just had this crazy victory in the film at the end of act two and then, but then you have to somehow like bring people back to reality and be like, okay, that was just one step in like this long history of the civil rights movement. And like, how do we, how do we convey that? Like, you know, and, and so that was a struggle for a long time until we found that one piece of footage. And it was like at the very end of editing. And it was so like, we all cried. It was like, uh. It was great. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I want to go from from that to because you do work with archival a lot, and um, and I love working with archival stuff too. Uh, how do you find the the balance between showing the archival and showing the talking heads? Because I uh, I mean you have a wealth of archival footage for Crip Camp. I mean, there's amazing stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But so many times it's, it's really great to watch someone remembering something and telling a story, like the bus driver uh, gonorrhea story <laughs> is one of my favorites. It's a spoiler, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so what's your, I mean, is it, I mean, to me, it's just more of a feeling, you know, what, you know, what I want, what you think the audience wants to see, but do, what, do you have a, like a, a formula or anything? I don't, not exactly. I, I mean, I think I err on the side of like seeing the person talking as little as possible and like only when absolutely necessary. But I think in, in Crip Camp, it's a little different because like you, uh, it's, you do want to like watch these characters telling their story. And so I would say like in this film, we would stay on the interviews more than I would in mm -hmm. other films. Mm -hmm. And also I want to say something really quick that really doesn't have anything to do with editing about Crip Camp. I loved the way y'all presented the captions for uh, any one of the characters or subjects who is hard to understand. They sort of like appear like little poems on the screen. It's so gorgeous. And it's really, it really struck me because it, you know, it's like you, 
you could have just slapped the captions on there, but it gave them weight, you know, just because they don't speak clearly doesn't mean that what they're saying is not as important as, you know, everybody else. And I thought it was really beautiful, but right. it has nothing to do with editing. <laughs> well, it does actually. I mean, I, I have to give a shout out to Lauren Schwartzman, who was our brilliant assistant editor and associate producer. She did so much on this film. She was on it from the very beginning to the very end. Um, I think she's still working with them now. Um, and it was her idea to do that. Um, and part of it was to, so that when you're reading the words, you can, um, they were closer to the person's mouth. Oh right? yeah. So you could actually like watch their face and hear them at the same time. And I think like, it really was just like a brilliant idea. It is really beautiful. Um, I swear we'll get back to you, Michael. Uh, I want to use that as like a segue into working with um, assistant editors and working with post-production supervisors. So I've never worked with an assistant editor before and I've edited eight feature films. Um, and it's always like, we're going to get you one. And then it's, oh, uh, that's the first thing to go. So, uh, and I would love to have one one day. Um, so I just want to sort of talk a little bit about like what that workflow is like, you know, is the, 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 the uh, assistant editor and the post-production supervisor like a team or how, who takes care of the archive? Is there somebody assigned to all of the archival footage or, you know, how does, how do, how do y'all work with assistant editors? and that flow. Uh, <clears throat> well, why don't I, um, I can talk about how it works in narrative films in particular. Mm -hmm. um, it typically, uh, the post-production supervisor is either on um, uh, right from the beginning, even before me, and is uh, working, uh, it's not really usually the person who hires the, the editor. Uh, that's usually a decision made uh, by the director. Uh, you know, with, with some input from producers. But in the case of Nine Days, the, the, my most recent narrative feature, uh, the post supervisor was on first, uh, basically because he was tasked with the idea of like, uh, where's our cutting room in New York going to be? Who's going to do the color work? And if the color work gets done at Goldcrest, will they give us a room that's cheap enough and that kind of thing? Uh, so he was on first and then... Uh, we had to hire an assistant editor for not too much money. And I was worried about getting someone good because it was a, technically a very challenging uh, job. But we, the script was, was uh, really excellent. And we had these wonderful actors, uh, Winston Duke, Zazie Beetz, uh, Bill Skarsgård. And I think somehow uh, with that, we were able, you know, to get uh, our initial assistant editor to come on for, you know, pretty decent fee. And he came on and initially he just did traditional assistant work and that he would bring uh, the dailies in, uh, you know, on a, on a narrative feature, you can kind of do it two ways. You can have a DIT on set who does color corrections, syncs everything up, transcodes for the avid and uh, the assistant in the room, it's largely an organi organizing job. Uh, sometimes you'll have a job where the assistant gets raw media and he or she is transcoding it and syncing it. But in this case, our, our initial assistant, uh, Phil Kimsey, did that, but it was a complicated job. So we wanted to make him more of an associate editor, which he became. And uh, he, he was on for the first time sort of third of the film. He had a prior deal with Netflix. That was part of the way we got him. And then we got um, this wonderful guy, Zach Boger, to come in after him, who became our additional editor. I'd worked with Zach on a recutting project in the spring in New York and gotten to know him that way. And, uh, you know, he basically, you know, cut the film with me very much. And then we, we had another editor who came in too. So there was the three of us ultimately a lot along with uh, our um, director of course so uh, there, it's the assistant is a complicated job because it's you know he or she gives you that level of confidence that you you know you'll have all your media 
ready to work with. Uh, and then if, if your film has visual effects in it, very often they're the pipeline person uh, to do visual effects comps so you can screen the movie, show, show what people will see eventually, but also uh, along with the super, post supervisor deal with the visual effects houses, you know, on the shots and they, they come up with all these different charts. And to be really honest, I don't pay much to attention to the charts after a while because I know that they're going to do it really well and I can just concentrate on working on the scenes with the director. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I think for me, in working in LA and on documentaries, like every project is kind of different but I think there's been a lot of like tension in the industry recently that it's become like such a technical job. Um, it's, it's about transcoding, organizing, you know, paperwork, like all these things. And um, there's so much of that to do because there's so much footage these days um, with, I mean, and this is true in the archival as well. But um, the, the assistant doesn't have a lot of time to like be mentored, to like learn from the editor. Um, and so a group of editors um, that I know in LA, like about a year and a half ago, we all got together and formed um, an alliance called the um, Alliance of Documentary Editors. Um, to address some of these issues, one of which is like mentorship for assistant editors. Um, so, and we've expanded now to New York. It's a, it's a national group. Uh, we're bringing in other cities as well. So like um, if there's any editors in Memphis that wanna look at it, you have to have like some credit in documentary to like become a part of the group. Um, but it doesn't have to be like a big credit or anything. It's just like you did one thing um, and it's assistant editors and editors as well. Um, and we post jobs on there. We have events, we do um, all kinds of stuff and trying to like work with producers in the industry to like teach them about what editors do and how much time we need to do stuff and um, dealing with like smaller and smaller schedules and things like that. Um, so I think a lot of, we're trying to like get back to how it used to be to where like, because I had a mentor, an editing mentor in my very first job in New York and sh she let me cut scenes and she would give me feedback on scenes. And it was like, the most valuable experience that I ever had. So all the assistants that I work with, I always try to give them things to cut, even if they like don't have time to. <laughs> like it just, it's become like a really important thing for me and a lot of the people that I work with here that we do that. That's really awesome. I, I, I think that's really important. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump in on you. No. Um, mentoring is so important and you know, none, none of us on this panel are, are really of the generation where, where you, you cut in a large film room and uh, you, you worked very closely with assistants and apprentices and uh, they'd all be in the room with you, with the director. And the, the, there were a lot of learning opportunities back then because the whole pace of editing was slower. You know, if, if you made a change in a film, you, you had to wait to be able to see it. Now, of course, we can, we can see dozens of versions of something with, within a few minutes. And the pace has become so fast. Um, sometimes your assist, I, I actually like it when the, my assistants are in the same room with me, ideally. Often uh, that's a good thing budget-wise too for the movie. I don't know what that's gonna be now, obviously, because we're talking about uh, larger spaces and more you know more room between everybody once we go back to work um but uh when when you are close in with someone you can you can talk through your edits you can show um versions of scenes to each other i always uh, you know try to uh, give some some of the footage to assistants to work on 
just because it's uh, it's fun, that it's a learning experience, uh, and um, it it helps me out because I, I'm not super fast, and I've always got a, you know my own deadlines to work on. So it's good. mentoring. I'm glad you brought up uh, mentoring, Eileen. Um. So yeah. So that brings me to a question that I had. So Memphis is obviously a non-industry town. Um, there's a lot of great filmmakers here and we thankfully have Indie Memphis um, as this sort of like, uh, I was, it's like a base for everybody to sort of like connect through um, and it's a really great filmmaking community. It's very supportive, um, but we don't have, you know, we have a couple of production houses, but you know, it's an X amount of people work at them. Um, so for instance, you know, like I've never, I, this is where I edit, <laughs> it's in this room by myself and then there will be a director here or on the couch behind me. Um, how, what kind of, how can I say this? You said a lot about, you know, mentoring and everything, but for someone who's not in New York or LA, um, uh, do you have advice for, you know, ways to learn? And, and obviously like when I first started, there was, I mean, there wasn't even YouTube. So like <laughs> I didn't even, there wasn't even any tutorials to watch. So there's thankfully that. Um, uh, and there's uh, one of the things I've been doing during this time, time of solitude is watching on Behance, Adobe put all of their, um, the NAB conference national, Association of Broadcasters conference that's usually in Vegas, they put all of their um, seminars online. So, you know, they're talking about new features in Adobe and everything. So I got to watch them and I've been doing all these, like I've been learning Illustrator and everything. So it's really cool. Um, but because editing is solitary by nature and you don't usually have a bunch of like editors hanging around together, um, how do you grow your craft? How does one grow their craft, whether you're here in Memphis or whether it's y'all? Because you want to keep on, I mean, I like to learn constantly. Yeah, I, I think um, I've always sought out other editors whenever I can. Um, it was even in New York, in Memphis, in LA, like when I first moved to LA, I went to every single event that I could possibly go to. And I met everyone. I met every editor. I met every documentary person. Like I was just like so eager to um, absorb knowledge. Uh, and I, so I think now is kind of an amazing time that everything's online. It's, I feel like there's probably a lot more opportunities for people that like aren't in LA or New York to get in on those like bigger events and like talk directly to an editor or filmmaker that you really love that's giving a panel or a talk somewhere you know I think um that now is a really good time probably to like get on that <laughs> yeah I think that's true and um yeah uh the union and some of the other organizations are having these things where it used to be like if you were lucky enough to be in LA or New York you could go to a panel or see something but like um, I mean like they're having like John Ottman who cut uh, Bohemian Rhapsody on a couple weeks from now for instance and used to you know it, it would have been if you were in New York you could go see that or LA but now you could be anywhere and just uh, tune into that. Um, um, I also, I tend to associate a lot with editors, you know, it's like being a cook, you know, you want, or chef, you know, you, you want to get together with them as much as possible because um, there's a lot of complaining that you want to do and you can't, you can't always do that <laughs> complaining with your director and your producers, you know, so, so you need, um, the, I have to say one thing I'm really missing in this quarantine is like, is that physical being with people. Um, this friend of mine, Joe Krings, invited me to kind of like, I don't know how to describe it. It's kind of like a turntable group where we all play DJ for each other. It's kind of silly, but like, um, you know, um, there's people you probably know, Eileen from LA on this, like, um, 
uh, Darren, what's Darren's last name? I'm sure you know him. He cut, he cut the lovers and, um, and uh, there's people that I only know, I only know their like code names. I don't even, I mean, like I know that this is one woman, I know her real name is Jem. I don't even know her last name. So, and I'm looking forward to the day where, you know, we can all get together in LA around a big table and sort of rehash this crazy, uh, horrible year that we've had. And, um, and get back to some sense of normalcy. But I, I learn a lot from my fellow editors, you know, uh, just how to do things, problems that we're having. If I'm having a tech technical issue, I reach out to people. I was just trying to switch Avid versions today and that was tricky. And um, uh, editors are my favorite people usually to come to test screenings. We haven't talked about that, but you know, that's obviously a big process of documentary and narrative editing of of testing your film. Uh, and that gets back to your thing, uh, Laura, about the audience. Uh, you really only get a sense of an audience, you know, you can have a head idea in your head, but you, you can only prove it or learn it for yourself to, to sh actually show it to people. Um, and, you know, mo most of the filmmakers I work with and producers really kind of relish this process. You know, they get nervous sometimes, but every now and then I've had one or two of where I've had to sort of really convince them about the need for these. But I always have a lot of editors come. Editors are great because uh, they can be very sort of uh, dispassionate in, in a good way. Like just really, they know what can be done to a film. Whereas someone else might have a desire for a film, but not have the language exactly, if that uh -huh. makes sense. So editors yes. are really helpful that way. And then I learn from them. And then I say, why, why, did, why did I cut it that way in the first place? I never should have done that. So you, you improve. And there's nothing like sitting in a room full of people, maybe your friends and watching something you've cut and then like noticing them like, squirming oh, or right. not laughing or laughing in the wrong place. I mean, that's like a really horrible experience sometimes. Um, but also, you know, I think that it's really important as an editor or as a filmmaker uh, to learn how to accept constructive criticism and also how to give it, you know, like when you watch, you know, if your friend sends you their movie and and all you say is that that's great. It's not doing anybody any good and vice versa. You know, you want somebody to say the pace is slow or I don't understand why the scene was first or whatever. Um, and I think that also um, a good way to learn more about editing is to watch really well edited movies, you know, like go to like go to like the Oscar lists and see what won best editing, you know, watch everything that Thelma Schoonmaker edited, you know, and you can learn by just watching really well edited movies and just like pay attention to the editing. And then you'll never be able to watch a movie without thinking about <laughs> editing again. Um, so I want you both have brought it, we have brought it up several times about here we are in this time of uh, pandemic, the time of pandemic, and productions are stopped, right? Um, and it's kind of a, I don't know, some days I feel hopeful about it because I feel like the independent film community is going to rise out of this before the Hollywood film community. The lower budget film productions are probably going to get started first because they don't have 40 people, specifically for narrative, because they don't have 40 people on their set or 400 people on their set, you know, it might be two people in the crew, you know, or I mean, I feel like, and the same with independent music, I feel like the there may be some sort of renaissance with film production on lower budget. And also if uh, Netflix and all of these places are looking for content and there's not gonna be anything in production for a while for Netflix, 
there's a lot of independent films out there that would be great for Netflix and they just need to be seen. You know, films that, that are at film festivals, smaller film festivals all the time. And we're getting to see some of them now, you know, like South by had, not that, not that it's a smaller film festival, but that sort of aspect. So uh, my, basically my question is like, what do you, like, what, what do y'all think? You're, Michael, you're in New York, is that right? Yes. So y'all are in ba ba industry town. It's like, what is the general feeling about like what the future might look like for film? Um, well, I'm optimistic. I have to be right because this is my life. This is a, this is the only thing I know how to do at this point. I've done other things, but I'm sort of um, <clears throat> I've now been doing this for about 15 or 16 years, and I've realized this is what I love the most. And you know, when I'm on a film, I can't wait to go. I can't wait to go in. Um, and I'm I'm usually sad going home. I'm not always sad, but I'm I'm. I, 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 I sometimes wish I could really go 24 hours all the time because I'm having so much fun, but you know, you get tired. Um, I have to, uh, I, I might be, I might have a documentary that I might work on this summer, which is good because at least, at least the footage has been shot. Um, other than that, to do another narrative film, I have to wait uh, for a crew to get together with an actor, uh, with a director and with producers. And um, I don't know when that's gonna happen. I'm, opti I'm hoping there seems to be some word uh, that things might gear up in August or September, I hope, but probably not much before that. I'm wondering what Sundance is going to be like now, even if there, if there is, will be a Sundance. I mean, those of us who've been to that kind of festival and I don't know, uh, you know, everyone listening in or, or, I mean, honestly, the first big festival of the year is probably going to be Indie Memphis, uh, which is great. Um, but uh I mean, uh, Ryan Watt, if you're listening in, you're gonna you're gonna have your pick of films this year. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And and I think you know, I mean, I feel really lucky because working in archival documentary, it's yeah. like, it all already exists, and so yeah. if somebody needs to go find the stuff. Um, and I'm lucky enough to like have already been on a project. Um, now and so I'm working from home still um so I feel really thankful about that but it could be that there's just like you know like a small boom of like what you said like more independent films or more documentaries or more like found footage or like and things where people are being creative and using stuff that already exists to make things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh that in the Tuesday night um uh, talk with Barry Jenkins, he said, you know, there's going to be 5,000 quarantine movies, but only one of them is going to be good. He's like, go make them, y'all, but only 4,999 of them are not going to be any good. But, you know, like what, how many Zoom movies are there going to be at the film festivals? It's going to be interesting. Um, and this is sort of jumping around, but I, I did want to talk to Michael about this because I had asked this question and it sort of led to something else because I was asking about um, uh, in the farewell there's a, a sort of this feeling of when Lulu who is Aquafina's character is in New York she's all alone and so she's seen all alone but when she gets to China she's with her family and the shots are like wide shots and they'll hold on that you'll hold on that wide shot so it's kind of like you get to see everybody in the family's reactions to what is going on. And I love that. It's like a play. Um, and it reflects, you know, her, you know, this is what she is part of is this group. And they're all this big group on the screen. So I wanted to know what, if that was an editorial decision of yours or if that was in the script or who's, who, who was that all about? And then you talked about being in China, like for the production, right? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, <clears throat> every, uh, you know, every director I've worked with uh, prepares in a different way. Uh, the, the really best ones will do some sort of 
shot listing with their DP well before the shoot occurs. So, and you don't always have to stick to that, but you have to have some sort of plan. Um, in Lulu's case, uh, she had gotten a, some sort of device for her iPhone um, where she was able to go out for like several weeks with her DP, Anna, and they shot the entire movie uh, in, in stills. Every single frame existed. And when I arrived in China a, a week before we started shooting, I got this huge booklet. I, I've still got it. I've still got the digital version on my phone. And it's like, it's every shot of the movie, usually with Lulu playing all the parts or her assistant. And they found some way to like composite, you know. So a lot of those shots in the movie where you see 11 people, I have versions where it's 11 of Lulu with different expressions. <laughs> and a number of those shots were really, you know, every director will have shots that are really important to them that they have to get. And was one of the shots that Lulu talked about constantly was when Aquafina first enters the apartment in China and the whole family stands up, that we had to, we had to get that in a wide shot so it, it would seem overwhelming to her that suddenly there's like 13 people, you know, crowding towards her. Um, Sometimes this was done, I, a lot of times it was planned because it was the way she could show the, the sense of community you have in the East as opposed to the, the more individualist um, West, you know, as, as the uncle talks about at the end of the movie. Uh, it was usually an aesthetic choice of Lulu's to do it that way, but it was also practical. Uh, we shot the movie in like 24 days in China. There was no way looking towards all those characters that oh, we could yeah. go in and get single shots of them and have the performances be good. It was better to do it wide and do it five or six times and, you know, to try to make it good. But the, the other thing which was interesting is that this was a film where we started, I started doing far more split screens in editing than I've done before. Uh, so for instance, there's a reverse of the shot of that shot I was talking about where uh, Aquafina sees the whole family, where we go back from the kitchen and now we see the family crowding around her. And Lulu and I realized that if we changed the left part of the frame and the right, we could actually have uh, her uncle and her dad converge on her. You, you know how Donald Trump used to stand uh, behind Hillary in those debates and it was the same sort of thing like they, they, they became very menacing in a comic way you know because there was always that comic touch to these scenes and uh, in that sense we're not relying on how the actors actually did it in the scene we're able to sort of punch it up a little bit um, um, Eileen I've been re-watching some of your work over the last week or so and and I have to say having done some documentaries myself, I do feel that the way you're, you are so fluid between uh, archival material, whether it's the um, William F. Buckley, Gore Vidal debates, or all of that uh, port pack black and white footage in Crip Camp, or, um, you know, all of the, the you know, hours and hours of courtroom footage from, um, you know, the neighbor next door. Um, do you use techniques like your your films seem very natural and sort of like in the best sort of way they seem to be just sort of there like they just happened obviously i'm sure it's a lot of work to make that happen but do you find yourself doing visual tricks also or timing tricks to kind of make that so fluid i'm, I'm wondering what your secret is um well i don't know if i have a secret i mean i think a lot of the projects I've, projects I've worked on, like those three that you mentioned, I worked collaboratively with a lot of other really brilliant editors. And so there's a lot of collaboration. Um, I think I, I look at archival and I've learned to look at archival as like present tense. And so I'm always trying to edit it not in like a past tense, but in a present tense, like at any point possible to like actually be able to like live in the footage, be immersed in it in the moment when whatever it was, was happening. Um, so 
So I think of it that way and I think I edit that way. And so it, it feels like present tense. And I think, and that's kind of a trick because a lot of times like your interview subjects are speaking about things in past tense or, you know, and, and that can be tricky, but, but trying to like edit around it to where like it feels like it's happening now, you know? Um, yeah, and one of the things I thought about, and we're gonna go to the questions in a second here. One of the things I thought about when I was, cause I watched Crip Camp for the first time yesterday and then I watched, and then I watched the Farewell for the second time. Um, is that both of these movies are kind of, are about finding your identity. You know, like how uh, uh, Billy in The Farewell is finding that she's, you know, she's been working on this identity as a writer in New York, but then she realized she has this identity as part of this family. And then the character or the subjects in Crip Camp are finding their identities as not the crippled kid, but as, you know, you know, I'm the guy who likes the Grateful Dead or I'm like this and they get to be who they really are. And so they're both kind of these, anyway, that's a little note there. Um, and, and one more thing, Eileen, I don't know if you know this, uh, and when you moved to LA, I started working for Robert Gordon and mm -hmm. I will never forget this. I got a project that you had worked on. It was one of those, um, like those Mississippi like blues, or I can't remember what they're called. Anyway, but I remember, uh, and I'd never, and I hadn't worked with anybody, you know, Robert was one of the, first, I guess he was the first director I'd worked with besides my husband. And um, I opened up one of your projects and it was like all, it was Final Cut and uh, it was all color coded. And I was like, oh, you can color code things. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, it was just such a revelation. And I was so excited that I had learned. So thank you for that. Now I'm an obsessive color coder <laughs> and organizer and my folders are all, and I'm all, that's the thing I always tell young editors. I'm like, you better organize that shit because if you get hit by a bus tomorrow, somebody's gonna have to come after you and figure out where everything is. Yeah. I love the organizing aspect mm -hmm. of editing and I, oh, need, yeah. I need everything. I'm so, so anal about it. Like I need everything to be edited or like organized because when I'm editing, like I need to just be in a flow. And yeah. if I'm like having to go look for something, it just breaks me out. And I'm just, it's like the most frustrating thing. And I, I hate it. So yeah, I've, I'm always organizing stuff. I probably drive my assistants crazy. Oh, I, I love it. I, I just, I'm like, I'm a Virgo. So I'm like always putting a box inside of a box inside of a box, you know, like this is, and it's like, this is how it's supposed to be. So anyway, I do want to mention also that uh, Michael edited one of my favorite documentaries ever. And I was so excited that when I found this out, um, Be Here to Love Me uh, by Margaret Brown, it was like, one of the very first like dot live, I don't know, Margaret was there at the screening and I forget where it was, but it was after I had just moved to Memphis, I think, or maybe right before, but I went to go see it and I was just like, oh, just in love, just so in love. And it was a big inspiration for me to like stay in documentary and work in like music documentaries. And um, yeah, one of my favorites. I'm really cool. glad you liked it. That was, you know, it, that was an interesting film because, um, it, you, you know, when you make a subject about someone who's no longer alive, you can't interview him. Towns had died 10 years earlier. Uh, um, also, if it's a lot, if you want to hear a lot of songs, you can have needle drops, but you have to have some sort of visual to go along. You can't so after a certain while, you know, you're going to get a little tired of sort of a, those Ken Burns sort of things, like, you know, move around the, the suit, you know. So um, part of the fun thing for that film was it was inventing shots that didn't exist. Um, and I think because we were doing that on, I think, Final Cut 2 or Final Cut 3, which crashed every time we rendered something, it would crash. 50% of the time. So uh, I always learned before I did a render to do a save, but 
it was still crash. A lot of times there's things in that movie where we would just take footage and just play it at 5% speed. So you just get all these beautiful little dots moving, you know, and then we could have Towns talk in the background because we had these recordings of him that this journalist had done from Look Magazine on a cassette in 1971. So we could play these like ultra low fidelity cassette recordings of Towns' voice against like little beautiful, pretty like moving dots. And we just had to hope that Towns was interesting enough that you wouldn't notice that we're just showing you like moving dots. We couldn't do that too often, but I made it fun. That's amazing. Okay, now we're gonna turn it over to the audience. Cause that's who we're here for. Joseph? Hey. Hey, I'm back. Okay, we have a few questions in the Q&A box and I'll uh, jump on those in just a moment. Um, let me get one question going from the box and then I'll start picking people who are raising their hand. I love it, we've got lots of questions. Okay, so Tony Oswald asks, uh, I'm about to start editing my first feature doc. It has a ton of archival footage and I'm wondering if you have any tips for how to prioritize the footage. Do you screen every second? Also, are there times when you feel overwhelmed or stuck? Good question, Tony. Um, well, that's awesome. Congratulations. Um, there are often times where I feel overwhelmed and stuck. That happens to everyone. Um, I often work with a team of people who are screening the archive because there's just never enough time for one person to sit and watch all of it. Um, but it really depends on the budget and, you know, if you have, if you can work with other people or what your schedule or time frame is, you know, if you're working on it over a long period of time, I would say like watch as much as you possibly can. Um, and in terms of like prioritizing the footage, I have like a couple of different systems that I use. Um, I use like a three star system where when I'm watching, if something is like, oh, that's interesting, I give it one star. If I'm like, that's pretty good, two stars, really good, I'm probably gonna use it three stars. Um, and then I also, if I'm cutting in a sequence, like if I have a string out of all the archive about a, from a certain place or time or however you're organizing your string outs, um, I make my selects and pull um, like a select to uh, the next visual layer. And then um, if it's really good, I bring it up to V3. And so it's, it's the same, concept is just using it if you're doing like markers versus um, in a sequence. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Michael or Laura Jean, did y'all have anything you wanted to add to that? I like that too. And also there's a way to um, drag out markers, which I just recently learned um, that you can make a note on your marker. I use that all the time. I, I had that. never seen it until I worked on Juvenile and I was like, oh my God, I want to go back and like do that for everything I worked on because it was such, it was such a great help. So yeah, yeah. it's just something I saw on too. <laughs> oh, so the other last thing I would say is when you're watching like tons and tons of archival footage, sometimes you'll come across something that's like so amazing, but you have no idea like where you, you want to use it or how to organize it. And so then I always have like a gold bin or like a best of bin where you just like throw something, throw the amazing things in the same place that you don't know where else to put it. And so you can always go back to that bin and, and kind of make sure that all the good stuff ends up actually in the film and you can always find it later. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I often have a like a miscellaneous bin like that too, and whether it's narrative or documentary, or like some moment that we found, maybe it's something the actor did. It doesn't really fit into the story necessarily, but we'd like to use somewhere. Maybe it's a piece of sound. Um, I think as you work on, especially on a documentary, sometimes you know the documentaries are because you don't have a script coming in usually, or you have something very loose. Uh, 
you're often working hard to make transitions between sequences or to go from this part to this part. And one way is you might have like a sort of what I call a wild card scene that's somewhat neutral that allows you to go from something to something. So that's not really the mm -hmm. best way to do a transition, but it does work some of the time. So especially if you've got a piece of gold that's not going to fit somewhere else, then that becomes its own little unit. And you can, and it's so good that again, you're you're distracting the audience from the fact that you didn't really do a real transition. <laughs> Hopefully. Okay. Um, I'm gonna bring in someone's raising their hand, uh, Clint Till. Um, I am going to promote you to a panelist. So you should have access to your microphone and yeah, there you are. Okay, can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. I'll start hey. with you here. Hi, Clint. Yeah. Hey, how are you doing? Good. I love all this talk about organization when it comes to editing. And I, and I like what you had to say about the star system and kind of how you work with clips and that gold bin is a great idea. I'm always interested to get editors thoughts on how they put their workflow. I was curious if you have any other tips in terms of the organizational process. One of the things I do a lot when I'm working with interviews is I'll, I sub clip, end up sub clipping everything. And then like, literally transcribing the sound by, you know, in, uh, in the description. So I know exactly later where that clip is. And I've talked to other editors that they just like to pull a string out of selects. And like you're saying, like put stuff on tracks above and below in terms of priority. So just any other things that you guys might do from a documentary standpoint to really organize the project and find things quickly. Uh, uh, Clint, I do exactly what you do, um, because uh, if you've got an interview, say like an hour long interview with someone, it's not the same thing as on a narrative where you've shot things for specific scenes uh, and your person is going to start uh, talking about, uh, you know, let's say you're doing um, a movie about, uh, I've been working on something recently about a group of women who ski to the North Pole, for instance. And let's say you've got a, a scientist from France who's talking about how fragile the ice is and we've got to get across the ice now because it's fragile and we might not be able to do, people might not be able to do this ever again. So I will turn that into a piece of speech in terms, you know, I'll make a clip and I'll say, uh, Susan's saying we've got to get across the ice now because it's fragile. And I know that that's a, I, you know, at that stage of the documentary, the director and I are thinking very conceptually. Uh, this was certainly true when I did The Order of Myths with Margaret Brown after Towns, which was a little more of a social commentary, political movie. Also great. Um, Love that thank one. you. Thank you. So again, it's like if I'd hear something from, say, Helen or Stephanie or Joseph, uh, you know, where Joseph would say, all I need to do is break bread with these white people and I'm going to feel okay about myself again. I know, well, that's got to be in the movie. So I would, I would sub clip it or do something like that. But I also do a lot with stacking and sometimes having a long string out, having little title cards. And again, it will be prioritized. Like it might be Joseph talks about how he admires the white people and I'll get that, that'll be the first thing. And then I'll have something that's not quite as good in second position. So if I know I need two things, I've got them both. But if I only need one, I'll use the first. And on narrative editing of scenes, I, I tend to look for what I think is gonna be the first shot in the scene as I'm going through the footage. And I'll put a version of it or take of it right in my timeline. And then I just put the next shot and the take I think I might use, but it's really rough. It's really rough. It's all these moments. It's just a, an idea of how the scene could be. And that's what I spend most of the time in when I'm doing a narrative scene. I, cause I can spend hours on that. And then after I've done that, I save it. And then uh, I work very fast to cut it into a scene, you know, perhaps within a few minutes. So it's all about rhythm and pacing and however I get inspired. And I'll, I'll change my mind a lot from what, what I've done with that original sequence and I'll come back to it at some point. But so it's a combination of preparation 
and uh, sort of thinking and being philosophical, uh, uh, but then also going with instinct. So trying to use really both parts of my brain, I guess. Mm -hmm. I'm the same way. I, I do a lot of preparation and then the editing actually, when I actually start editing, it goes really fast. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say also it depends on whether you're using, or for me at least, whether I'm on Premiere or Avid. I organize things differently and I work differently. Um, I was on Premiere for a long time and was very reluctant to learn Avid because I just like hate, hated it and didn't even want to touch it. Uh, but you can't live in LA forever and not ever do an Avid project. So I had to learn it a couple years ago and now I'm on my second Avid project. Um, and I feel like it's different because in Premiere, I work primarily in sequences and in Avid, I work primarily in bins. Um, and so I end up subclipping into bins when I'm working in Avid and in Premiere, I'm doing select sequences, um, but it's essentially the same thing. Like a bin is basically a sequence. Um, and I'm making like string outs of themes or string outs of scenes. Like I, I think I, we do a lot of both where, especially in documentaries, it's like, we'll have like this theme and this theme and this idea and this idea, and we'll do a string out of everything that has to do with that idea. Mm -hmm. And then when I uh, start to actually cut scenes, then I take those theme bins, I'll probably have three or four themes to like work with for a particular scene. And then I'll start breaking everything down into a scene bin or a scene sequence. Um, and I'm pulling from the theme bins. Um, and we also do a lot of like transcripts of interviews or in Avid, we use script sync, which is like the most amazing thing in the world for a documentary. The only thing I like about Avid is script sync. And if Premiere ever gets on that, which they've promised me they will <laughs> soon, uh, that's gonna be a game changer because it's amazing. You can just find a word or a phrase anywhere in the project. Oh my God. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they need to get on that. Yeah, they're working on it. They did, They actually, um, uh, um, Adobe just came out with this thing called Productions, which is like a really cool, it's not like the team projects thing. It's more like, it's more made for documentaries and for um, like for series. Uh, kind of stepped it. It's, I, I'm very excited, and now I now I need another movie to edit so I can work with it. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you, Clint. I'm going to send you okay. back. To, yeah. Uh, thank you guys so much. Really appreciate you. all the insights. All right. Next, I am going to bring in Brandon. Brandon Roten. Uh, I'm promoting you to panelist. There he is, and you should be able to unmute yourself, Brandon. There, there we go. are. There you go. Hey. There we are. Hi. Hey. Hi. Uh, Eileen, uh, Michael, thank you uh, for your time uh, doing this. My question uh, had to do with um, rhythm of your films. Uh, I was listening uh, to both of you talk, and I, I kind of realized that both of you had films that required uh translation or captioning or there were there were times I, I obviously don't speak um mandarin i guess is 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 what it would be so i read a lot and there were circumstances in crip camp where um we couldn't understand the you know the 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 character so we had to we had to read um and so it got me wondering was there a difference in those parts of your films with your rhythm, with finding your rhythm for maybe like a music music cues for Crip Camp or reaction shots for um, uh, The Farewell. Uh, did you find that to be a unique challenge at all? Or is that something that I was kind of thinking of it? It's like my um, when my kids were little, like nobody could understand them, but I spent so much time with them that I completely understood everything they were saying. Does it become like that? Um, hope, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, does, is that something you can speak to? 
with finding the rhythm in, in circumstances where you might not speak the language or understand completely? Mm -hmm. I think it does affect the rhythm. Um, for me, like it, I did a lot of editing in um, like Hebrew in uh, The Devil Next Door and like where I, I did not know what they were saying and we had to have people come in later and translate and stuff. And I think it does change the rhythm like once you have the words on screen. Is that your experience, Michael? Yeah, um, well, it's interesting because Chinese is, is a tonal language. Um, it's really, I don't know, it's funny. I mean, I still was sort of cutting the scenes according to how I felt they should play dramatically or in terms of going for comedic beats. Uh, the interesting thing is I don't really think of that film as a film about spoken language. I think that Lulu is such a visual artist that I think you could actually turn the subtitles off and you could, you could, I think you could understand at least half of what's going on just from the way people are, their intonation, you know, like if you, if you had that scene early, well, the early on that, that scene's in English, but you, you could see um, Billy pleading for things with her grandmother and have, you could see the way the grandmother is talking to her and the framing. And, and I think you'd have an idea of what it's about. You wouldn't have it exactly, but I would still, I would still just, I, I don't know. It's hard to say. I didn't really cut it from a point of view of like how the subtitles were going to go, or even in terms of, um, uh, there's not much of an answer. I think it was for me. It was the same. It it just that just felt like an added layer, but I didn't find it as a distraction. I mean, I'll tell you <clears throat> what I did in China is I had a hotel room which had a, a living room attached, and that became my edit room. So I was always like, you know. Uh, I was in the same town where we were filming and my assistant would come in and we'd share that, that extra room that I had. And she was completely bilingual. She was from Shanghai and she'd learned English uh, watching American TV shows. So I would always do the first, she'd give me the dailies, you know, she'd organize them. She said, you know, I've, I've got, you know, scene 59 for you, whatever. And I would do the first pass using the script uh, which I don't usually do in narrative. Usually I sort of put the script aside and I just sort of, I sort of let the footage do the talking. I, you know, how, what sort of inspires me, but in, because I don't speak Mandarin, I would use the script as a guide, but there were no subtitles. You know, sometimes people have asked me if uh, there were subtitles on the footage, you know, when I got it, there weren't. So I'm again going by this sort of emotional quality of the acting and the faces and the visual material to, to try to sort it out. And then I would give the scene to my assistant and she would put subtitles on and she would tell me if I got something really wrong in terms of dialogue, like if I misunderstood something or if I clearly used a terrible take. Uh, because I, you know, I couldn't it was funny, even then when I started working with Lulu, sometimes we would compare three different takes and to my ear, they all sounded completely different from each other. And sometimes Lulu would be like, yeah, two's good and three's good and one is almost good. And I said, how can they all be like almost good? They sound completely different to me. And she said, well, you know, that's the difference between you and me. I speak it and you don't. So I just had to, you know, follow her advice at that point. Um, I'll say one last thing um, just about Crip Camp and using the type of subtitling that we used mm -hmm. um, that, you know, when someone is speaking slower, um, we had it come on screen as they're saying the words. And so, this is really important when they're telling a joke because if you just have regular subtitles, it just gives away like a con right. like a punchline before they've gotten to the punchline, and that was a huge problem. And so um, that's like one example where it affected the timing and uh, like how we use the subtitles. Great, thank, thank you. you. I appreciate it. 
Thank awesome. you for your question. Okay, uh, next I have Alex Pilkington coming at us from Queens, New York. Alex, promoting you to panelist. And you should be able to unmute, there you go. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can't see you. Yet. Hey, uh, there we go. Oh, there you are. Hey, uh, first I just wanted to thank everyone and say hi to folks in Memphis. Uh, it's good to see Eileen since haunting the high tone back in the day. And I believe you're both uh, blue collar post collective uh, fellows as well. So nice to see you. Um, so I'm a, a post super here in New York. And one of the biggest issues that I'm finding, especially now in pandemic land, but also long before, is uh, striking a, a healthy work life balance. Um, and I know every editor has a different view on that. You know, we can all read about Walter Murch running around the block for six hours before he goes in to cut something or something like that. But I think more what I'm curious about is, you know, I, I see a lot of editors where they'll work long, long overtime hours. And to some folks, the hours obviously they matter because they're money, right? And some people are just like, I'm gonna work what I gotta work because we gotta get the story told and we gotta get the, the thing done. And some people are like, hey man, you got my time for four or five hours, that's what you got my time for and then we'll try to try again tomorrow. And I'm curious from your personal perspectives, you know, how you strike that balance. Do you do it on a case by case basis is, you know, do you have the, the, this is a love project, this is a money project, or you, do you try not to make those separations? You know, how do you find yourself saying, hey, I'm going to commit to this and give this project it, the attention it deserves without saying, uh, I'm not gonna respect my life and my boundaries and my health, you know? Um. Uh, for me, for me, there are no money jobs, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe one of these days, uh, but not and seriously. I mean, I, I, I don't always have that much choice between a script. You know, sometimes I, you know, I might be up for three jobs, and I'm thinking, oh, you know, if I get these two, how am I gonna like? What am I gonna do? How am I gonna tell this other person I can't do that? And it always works out. I only get one of them at, at best. But um, somehow I end up doing the kind of jobs that I like. Uh, I think that I steer my head towards them somehow, but I'm not always sure of the process that re uh, results in that. But I will tell you, if I'm on a film that I especially love, which, um, is, which is most of them, honestly, um, but especially something like Nine Days last year, it's like, you know, my wife can tell you, I mean, no, I, I'm, I was, we thought we were making something really special there. And I needed to put so much into that movie to make it what it is, along with what Zach did and Jeff and everyone. I had two other assistants eventually. We all, we all ended up in this room, this fish tank room, and we'd be there from, you know, 8.30 or 9 in the morning until midnight or at least 10, you know, seven days a week. Uh, I think at one point I worked something like 35 days in a row. And um, it was just like, it, 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 had, it had to be done. It was like, we, we shared the director's passion. The director was extremely passionate. Uh, he inspired us, you know, if he wasn't there doing it with us, you know, if, if he was just, you know, lolling around New York, going out to lunch, going out to dinner, you know, that would have been different, but he was there in the trenches with us and uh, eventually so were some, some of the producers. So it was just, uh, they're not all like that, but, and honestly, uh, I'm very much enjoying this period right now of doing almost nothing. Um, I'm working a little bit, but I'm, I'm like, I've never, I haven't had a recharge the battery thing like this in years. And I know a lot of people are suffering and it's a terrible, terrible thing that's happening. 
But for me personally, it's, it's a timeout and um, it's something that I needed. And um, I do say on every project, I'm going to uh, have more boundaries. And uh, sometimes I do, but sometimes I just, I, it, it's exciting. It's just like, you know, it's just exciting to throw yourself into something and just, you know, you, you know, your, your whole existence is at the mercy of that. And um, maybe it means giving up a little part of your personality even, uh, but eventually you get it back. I have to say Crip Camp felt very similar. Um, we were all in the trenches together. I mean, I've worked some really late nights on that project and I worked really hard on it. And I, and I do that a lot. And I think on Crip Camp, like I was happy to do it because I loved the film so much and I loved the people I was working with so much. And we all felt like it was just like such a special project. And so, yeah, I was happy to, stay late and work my ass off. Um, I have to say like, I have done that on projects before that, where that wasn't appreciated or the people weren't in the trenches with me or it didn't feel good. It felt abusive or it felt taken for granted. And, um, you know, there were, there's been times where I've burnt myself out in like a really bad way and almost quit editing altogether. Um, and so I think if you're gonna like put everything you have and have no life and like work your ass off, it's gotta be for like the right people. It's gotta be for the right project. And it's gotta be for people that like appreciate that. And also who are willing to like give you time to like make the best film that you can make. Um, so yeah, I think it depends on the project, um, but I do think it's also like a tricky thing like in LA where um, because like more and more documentaries have started like taking on reality producers in LA, like the the understanding of like how long it takes to actually cut a documentary versus like a reality show is lost on a lot of people. And so, you know, one of the things that we try to do is like teach people like what the difference is and like work with producers and post producers and to like have appropriate schedules for the types of projects that we're doing. And I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Cool. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Good to see you. Good to see you in New York. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, okay, so we have like three more people. We need to probably wrap this up soon ish. So, the next few people I call on, if you could just um, make your question quick if possible. Um, I'm going to call in uh, Tim Prudhomme next. Uh, Tim, you are now a panelist. You uh, unmute Tim on your end. Yeah, I'm, I'm unmuted. Perfect. Welcome, Tim. What's your question? Thank you. Hi, Tim. Um, have any of you started to work on a film because you like the director and you like the project? but then got the footage and it was really bad and so you quit? <laughs> or do you follow traditional wisdom that even total garbage can be saved in the editing room? <laughs> Elaine? Laura? Um, I mean, I have, I have had that experience um, and I've I think I tried to save something that was unsavable. <laughs> um, and that was probably not the best idea, but um, I think, you know, early on in, in my career, I had less of knowledge of like, like how much something could be fixed versus like, we don't have a film here. Um, and so I think, 
over time I've learned that. And so I can tell before I even agree to do a project, like I will look at the footage and I will see that there is enough there to make a good film. Mm -hmm. I guess, um, Eileen, often when you're hired on a documentary, will they have shot a great deal of it already? Or do you sometimes come on right at the beginning also? I do sometimes come on at the beginning, um, but usually they have like quite a lot done, whether it's shot or found. Um, I won't come on until they've got like a lot of it shot, organized, um, broken down. That makes sense. So they, a, um, a lot of the times, not all the time. But. Uh, for me, <clears throat> again, um, it's hard to, you know, I think earlier in my career, there were, there were definitely films I worked on that when the footage started coming in, it was, um, I was like, not as happy with it as I would like to be. But even then, usually, I, usually I'm on for the shoot. So I'm actually able to give feedback to the director, especially, you know, especially if I'm working with a first or second time director, which I, which I often am, uh, there tends to be a tendency, like for instance, just not to do enough takes. Uh, on a narrative film, it's all about those actors. You know, I know the cinematographer thinks it's about the shots. And on some films, it is. I think with Lulu's movie, for instance, although the acting was superb too. But uh, Lulu's film was one where definitely it's like the, the cinematography and the acting, it's all in concert with each other. But, uh, you know, for a narrative film, you've got to have the performances, whether it's a drama or comedy or action or horror, you, you've got to have, you, it, you've got to be able to feel it. It's got to feel real. And, and um, if you've got, look, if you've got like, okay, let's say you have John Lithgow and Alfred Molina. Well, they're going to be good the first two takes. They're going to be fine. But an actors, actors like those or like um, Marissa Tomei, they're going to be even better probably on take number six if you let them go that far because they're like artists, they're like Picasso. They, they're they bringing all this to what they're doing and you've got to let them play. You've got to let them do what they can do with this, this magic that they're capable of. And unfortunately, as you know, in narrative films, we have this thing called the call sheet that says we're supposed to do X number of scenes in a day. And there's always gonna be people on that set who are like, oh, we made our day. Oh, we made our day, you know, but you know, you didn't make your day if you didn't get the scenes. Even if, even if according to the script supervisor's report, you did get make the scenes because you shot the scenes. But if you didn't get something that's going to be magical, uh, you know, then of course we as editors, we do, we try to make it magic and we maybe will tell ourselves that we can do it. And I do think every film can be improved. Um, I've, uh, I've been doing more recutting lately of things and I've come in sometimes and seen an entirely cut film that's like really not good, really not good. And at first I have to think, ah, do I even really want to do this? But it sort of fits in with my time and everything. And, you know, most of those have turned out much better, you know, maybe not always great films, but but really good films that film are enjoyed by people that, you know, do go to, you know, Amazon and Netflix and or theatrical or festivals and people have a good time and they don't know the, the struggle that we had in making the film. So I, I don't know. I hope that's an answer uh, that makes yeah. sense. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Thank Thanks, you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Okay, uh, we've got one more person raising their hand. Uh, Catherine, if you are ready, I will promote you to the panelist. And this should probably be our last question for the night. Um, Catherine, you should be unmuted. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Hi, um, I am a uh, an actor and producer, but I'm directing my first film right now. So it's my first time interacting with an editor from the perspective of a director. And um, 
you all already touched on this a bit in your last question about getting the shots uh, and making sure that like you're getting that performance from an actor, which like I love hearing because I agree. Um, but I was wondering what is helpful for an editor when it comes to uh, variation in takes? Obviously like continuity is important, but when it comes to like emotional variation, um, what's something that is like helpful for an editor and what is an example of not helpful? Um, well, uh, to talk about narrative, um, an example would be a movie that, you know, that I just did with Zach last year, Nine Days, that was at Sundance. It's, it's kind of a complicated story. And there's a lot of, there's a very subtle emotional shifts that occur with the lead character, especially from mm -hmm. the beginning of the movie to the end. And, you know, there's, uh, I don't like to get too fancy with terms with acting like, you know, colors of a performance or whatever, but like modulation is important. And with a really good actor, they're not always sure where the scene is going to be placed because maybe it might get moved. Maybe we might use it in a different way. They're not sure what happened in the other scene, the scene before it, because we haven't even shot it yet. So, and yet it will take place in the viewer's experience before that. So a good actor, and this really happened with Winston Duke, for instance, um, on the last film. If you do five or six takes, they will be different. Um, mm. Some will be softer, some will be warmer, some will be colder, some will be harsher, some will be faster. Speed is important. Um, uh, I did a movie once with Michael Shannon and um, a couple actually, and one he played Elvis, uh, Elvis Presley actually from Memphis. And I remember Liza and I showed that movie to uh, uh, our good friend Ira Sachs, also from Memphis. And he was the first person to see it after four weeks. And he said, well, you know, there's definitely potential here, but Michael Shannon talks so slowly, you've got to make him talk at least twice as fast. So every time you cut to Kevin Spacey, uh, you've got to speed Michael Shannon up. And luckily, Liza was going away for like a few days to do something. So like I had like three days where every time we were cutting away from, from Michael, I'm just like taking all that space out. And, you know, I know, mm -hmm. Eileen, I'm, obviously you do that a lot. We all do that in um, dialogue editing on documentaries, uh, you know, because, we, you know, you often want to preserve the character of someone's speech, but you can't always put it in the way they say it. You know, there's, just, there's not enough time for one thing. And a lot of people, you know, are stuck with all these, uh, well, you know, just like I do, like, you know, you know, um, saws and all that. So there's, there's that part of it too. Um, Eileen? Um, oh, yeah. It's been a long time since I've worked on a narrative. I have done a few, um, but I don't, I'm trying to remember. I mean, I think it's just about like, like really knowing what you want out of the scene and out of the performance and, and trying to get it, you know, and like, not necessarily giving like, oh, let's do one faster and slower, like for variety. I think it's more about like being, um, you know, directed about what it is that you want. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Okay, um, do you all uh, have any last things you want to say or make sure you got were able to share before we wrap it up? Um, I, we went a while. <laughs> Great. I mean, we covered a lot and everybody seemed to uh, be really engaged with us tonight. So thank you, Michael. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you, Laura Jean. Thank you. Thank you, you thank all. You, Joseph, for organizing this with us and putting us, uh, putting me together with. Uh, you guys with Eileen and Laura Jean. I hope to uh, see you both in person. Yes. 
I seem to yes. see I seem to Joseph once a year lately. Uh, I hope that tradition keeps up. I'm old news by now, yeah. <laughs> yeah really I, um, sorry, so, I didn't see your question until now. Oh, is there another question? Oh, I see another question. Oh, I just in the Oh, type. I think we will answer. Oh yeah, I've I've been I've been multitasking. You got it. Okay. You want, well, I haven't you, even looked at any you of this want to know what technical things like is it good to know after effects and stuff like that? if you're starting out as a documentary person. Yeah. Yes. I don't know any of that stuff, really. So Me neither. Me neither. Look at that. <laughs> I think it's... Uh, it depends. I mean, if you... I think if you're working on smaller projects that have smaller budgets and smaller crews, then it is important. But um, if you're... Like, for me, I just, like, really wanted to focus on editing and, like, less about, like, all of the other technical stuff and so I was lucky to be able to like work on projects where I could do that and there were other people that could come on and do more like VFX stuff or um, graphics and things like that. Yeah if you're I mean I'm kind of a one-man band a lot of times when I'm working on projects you know I'm like yeah. doing the transcripts and doing you know the titles and the end credits and everything so yes learn all and the things. I did more of those things early on and then was like very relieved when I could <laughs> stop doing them. <laughs> well, cool. Thank you all again. And uh, Eileen, hopefully we'll get a chance to bring you to Memphis sometime whenever there's uh, a- I miss it so much. Yes. <laughs> yeah. we'll I would love to come back. Definitely. And Michael, of course, you're always welcome as well as Judy, so. Give our love to Judy as well. I will. I will. She's she's over there somewhere. She says hello. Uh, and Laura Jean, thank you for for moderating tonight. The questions were great. Hey, it was great awesome. You thank, thank you, Laura Jean. Thank you. See y'all later. Thank Bye. you, the audience tonight. Thank you all for being so engaged and asking questions. So great. Thank you, audience, for showing thank up. You guys. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.